Section ten of the Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seven. The Governor's Hall. Hester Prynne went one day to the mansion of Governor Bellingham with a pair of gloves which she had fringed and embroidered to his order, and which were to be worn on some great occasion of state, for though the chances of a popular election had caused this former ruler to descend a step or two from the highest rank, he still held an honourable and influential place among the colonial magistracy. Another, and far more important reason, than the delivery of a pair of embroidered gloves impelled Hester, at this time, to seek an interview with a personage of so much power and activity in the affairs of the settlement. It had reached her ears that there was a design on the part of some of the leading inhabitants, cherishing the more rigid order of principles in religion and government, to deprive her of her child. On the supposition that Pearl, as already hinted, was of demon origin, these good people not unreasonably argued that a Christian interest in the mother's soul required them to remove such a stumbling-block from her path. If the child, on the other hand, were really capable of moral and religious growth, and possessed the elements of ultimate salvation, then, surely, it would enjoy all the fairer prospect of these advantages, by being transferred to wiser and better guardianship than Hester Prynne's. Among those who promoted the design, Governor Bellingham was said to be one of the most busy. It may appear singular, and indeed not a little ludicrous, that an affair of this kind, which in later days would have been referred to no higher jurisdiction than that of the select men of the town, should then have been a question publicly discussed, and on which statesmen of eminence took sides. At that epoch of pristine simplicity, however, matters of even slighter public interest, and of far less intrinsic weight, than the welfare of Hester and her child, were strangely mixed up with the deliberations of legislators and acts of state. The period was hardly, if at all, earlier than that of our story, when a dispute concerning the right of property in a pig not only caused a fierce and bitter contest in the legislative body of the colony, but resulted in an important modification of the framework itself of the legislature. Uh oh, so the gossipers have been talking about Pearl. <laughs> um, that's my cat, so this is Kelvin, and I'm not even going to take that out. So, this is Kelvin. <laughs> She's going to be hanging out with us today. Um, so the gossipers have been talking about Pearl, and they think that she's a little demon child, and they want to take her away from Hester in order to, quote-unquote, save her soul. So you could either look at that as trying to go and save Hester's soul, or to also save Pearl's soul. Um, so that's not good. You don't want to take away the baby from her mom. And, I mean, Hester went and gave up everything for Pearl. <laughs> This is going to be entertaining, I'm sorry, but uh, enjoy the tale. She uh, she will go and it will become really fuzzy when she's excited. And she's pretty, pretty happy right now. Full of concern, therefore, but so conscious of her own right that it seemed scarcely an unequal match between the public on one side and a lonely woman backed by the sympathies of nature on the other. Hester Prynne set forth from her solitary cottage. Little Pearl was, of course, her companion. She was now of an age to run lightly along by her mother's side, and, constantly in motion, from morn till sunset, could have accomplished a much longer journey than that before her. Often, nevertheless, more from caprice than necessity, she demanded to be taken up in arms, but was soon as imperious to be set down again, and frisked onward before Hester on the grassy pathway, with many a harmless trip and tumble. We have spoken of Pearl's rich and luxuriant beauty, a beauty that shone with deep and vivid tints, a bright complexion, eyes possessing intensity both of depth and glow, and hair already of a deep glossy brown, and which, in after years, would be nearly akin to black. There was fire in her and throughout her, she seemed the unpremeditated offshoot of a passionate moment. Her mother, in contriving the child's garb, 
had allowed the gorgeous tendencies of her imagination their full play, arraying her in a crimson velvet tunic of a peculiar cut, abundantly embroidered with fantasies and flourishes of gold thread. So much strength of colouring, which must have given a wan and pallid aspect to cheeks of a fainter bloom, was admirably adapted to Pearl's beauty, and made her the very brightest little jet of flame that ever danced upon the earth. It's now a couple years later from like the previous chapter when Pearl was an infant, um, and she's still a very vivacious, weird child. Um, and I mean, it doesn't really come right out and say how old she is, but it does say that she was now of an age to run lightly along by her mother's side, constantly in motion from morn till sunset, could have accompanied a much longer journey than before her. So, I mean, she's not like little, little, she's able to walk. Um, but then it says she demanded to be taken up in arms, but then was set down again. Um, so, I mean, she's still like old enough to be picked up and carried. Um, so I would say she's like, I don't know, anywhere between like two and four, maybe just depending upon like how big she is. Um, and she is gorgeous. Um, hair is a deep glossy brown and she still has like that, that fire within her. Um, and Hester is still dressing her in those fanciful clothes. Um, and I like it how she's kind of like an, an offshoot of what her mother wears with the uh, the crimson A or the, the scarlet letter that she has to wear um, because um, Pearl, words, I know them. Pearl is wearing a crimson, so it's going to be a dark red velvet tunic with embroidery in gold thread. So very much, there's Calvin again. Hi, Calvin. Bye, Calvin. Um, you know, it just kind of reflects what's going on and what um, Hester is having to wear. Now, again, it's just kind of interesting that Dinsdale and Chillingworth have not been mentioned in a while. Where have they been? Remember that, you know, like the, the entire problem of this story is that he wants to go and, and find out who the father is. Um, so this is known as the rising action. It's just where more and more and more stuff is uh, taking place. Um, and... I mean, she's on her way to go see the governor, not only to go and drop off the gloves, but also to go and pretty much plead for why she should still be able to have her child. But it was a remarkable attribute of this garb, and indeed of the child's whole appearance, that it irresistibly and inevitably reminded the beholder of the token which Hester Prynne was doomed to wear upon her bosom. It was the scarlet letter in another form, the scarlet letter endowed with life. The mother herself, as if the red ignominy was so deeply scorched into her brain that all her conceptions assumed its form, had carefully wrought out the similitude, lavishing many hours of morbid ingenuity to create an analogy between the object of her affection and the emblem of her guilt and torture. But, in truth, Pearl was the one as well as the other, and only in consequence of that identity had Hester contrived so perfectly to represent the scarlet letter in her appearance. As the two wayfarers came within the precincts of the town, the children of the Puritans looked up from their play, or what passed for play with those sombre little urchins, and spake gravely one to another. Behold, verily, there is the woman of the scarlet letter, and, of a truth, moreover, there is the likeness of the scarlet letter running along by her side. Come, therefore, and let us fling mud at them." But Pearl, who was a dauntless child, after frowning, stamping her foot, and shaking her little hand with a variety of threatening gestures, suddenly made a rush at the knot of her enemies, and put them all to flight. She resembled, in her fierce pursuit of them, an infant pestilence, the scarlet fever, or some such half-fledged angel of judgment, whose mission was to punish the sins of the rising generation. She screamed and shouted too, with a terrific volume of sound, which, doubtless, caused the hearts of the fugitives to quake within them. The victory accomplished, Pearl returned quietly to her mother, and looked up, smiling into her face. Even though Pearl is her own character, she almost seems otherworldly, um, and she is just a walking and talking symbol. 
um, to remind us as well as Hester and the townspeople of her sin for having a baby. Um, now notice in here Hawthorne's use of the variations for the words of red and fire. So I mean from previous we had crimson and the flames, um, we had the scarlet letter in another form, we have you know just like the red that's in there, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but I mean it's everything is supposed to go and just remind us of poor Hester's guilt and torture that she is just in there but she's also above everything else which is kind of cool and then I wanted to go and talk about how these two little evil children they go and they see Hester and Pearl just walking down the street and they decided it was a good idea to go and fling mud at them what like okay I understand that kids can be mean and cruel but that's just terrible and but Pearl is like a little force to be reckoned with and she goes and scares them off and she's just like this little dervish that goes and explodes and then comes quietly back and smiles at her mom. A little scary. Without further adventure they reached the dwelling of Governor Bellingham. This was a large wooden house, built in a fashion of which there are specimens still extant in the streets of our older towns now moss-grown, crumbling to decay, and melancholy at heart with the many sorrowful or joyful occurrences, remembered or forgotten, that have happened and passed away within their dusky chambers. Then, however, there was the freshness of the passing year on its exterior, and the cheerfulness, gleaming forth from the sunny windows, of a human habitation into which death had never entered. It had, indeed, a very cheery aspect, the walls being overspread with a kind of stucco in which fragments of broken glass were plentifully intermixed, so that when the sunshine fell aslantwise over the front of the edifice, it glittered and sparkled as if diamonds had been flung against it by the double handful. The brilliancy might have befitted Aladdin's palace, rather than the mansion of a grave old Puritan ruler. It was further decorated with strange and seemingly cabalistic figures and diagrams, suitable to the quaint taste of the age, which had been drawn in the stucco when newly laid on, and had now grown hard and durable, for the admiration of after-times. Pearl, looking at this bright wonder of a house, began to caper and dance, and imperatively required that the whole breadth of sunshine should be stripped off its front, and given her to play with. "'No, my little Pearl,' said her mother, "'thou must gather thine own sunshine, I have none to give thee." They approached the door, which was of an arched form and flanked on each side by a narrow tower or projection of the edifice, in both of which were lattice windows, with wooden shutters to close over them at need. Lifting the iron hammer that hung at the portal, Hester Prynne gave a summons, which was answered by one of the governor's bond-servants, a free-born Englishman, but now seven years a slave. During that term he was to be the property of his master, and as much a commodity of bargain and sale as an ox or a joint-stool. The serf wore the blue coat, which was the customary garb of serving-men of that period, and long before, in the old hereditary halls of England. "'Is the worshipful Governor Bellingham within?' inquired Hester. "'Yea, forsooth,' replied the bond-servant, staring with wide-open eyes at the scarlet letter, which, being a newcomer in the country, he had never before seen. Yea, his honourable worship is within, but he hath a godly minister or two with him, and likewise a leech. Ye may not see his worship now. Nevertheless, I will enter, answered Hester Prynne, and the bond-servant, perhaps judging from the decision of her air, and the glittering symbol in her bosom, that she was a great lady in the land, offered no opposition. So the mother and little Pearl were admitted into the hall of entrance. With many variations, suggested by the nature of his building materials, diversity of climate, and different mode of social life, Governor Bellingham had planned his new habitation after the residences of gentlemen of fair estate in his native land. Here we have a little bit more of Hawthorne being kind of haughty towards the Puritans. Remember that he was not a huge fan of them. And he's talking about Governor Billingham's home. 
and remember that the Puritans are supposed to be very plain um, and just, you know, I don't want to say basic, but, you know, just they're, that's the only word I can think of at the moment. So the people who are in charge don't really seem to practice what they preach because, I mean, like, this is seeming like something for the aristocrats that would live there. Um, just everything's very over the top and just being like, look how fancy I am. Here, then, was a wide and reasonably lofty hall, extending through the whole depth of the house, and forming a medium of general communication, more or less directly, with all the other apartments. At one extremity this spacious room was lighted by the windows of the two towers, which formed a small recess on either side of the portal. At the other end, though partly muffled by a curtain, it was more powerfully illuminated by one of those embowed hall windows which we read of in old books, and which was provided with a deep and cushioned seat. Here, on the cushion, lay a folio tome, probably of the Chronicles of England, or other such substantial literature, even as, in our own days, we scatter gilded volumes on the centre-table, to be turned over by the casual guest. The furniture of the hall consisted of some ponderous chairs, the backs of which were elaborately carved with wreaths of oaken flowers, and likewise a table in the same taste, the whole being of the Elizabethan age, or perhaps earlier, and heirlooms, transferred hither from the governor's paternal home. On the table, in token that the sentiment of old English hospitality had not been left behind, stood a large pewter tankard, at the bottom of which, had Hester or Pearl peeped into it, they might have seen the frothy remnant of a recent draught of ale. On the wall hung a row of portraits, representing the forefathers of the Bellingham lineage, some with armour on their breasts, and others with stately ruffs and robes of peace. All were characterised by the sternness and severity which old portraits so invariably put on, as if they were the ghosts, rather than the pictures, of departed worthies, and were gazing with harsh and intolerant criticism at the pursuits and enjoyments of living men. At about the centre of the oaken panels that lined the hall was suspended a suit of mail, not, like the pictures, an ancestral relic, but of the most modern date, for it had been manufactured by a skilful armourer in London the same year in which Governor Bellingham came over to New England. There was a steel headpiece, a cuirass, a gorget, and greaves, with a pair of gauntlets and a sword hanging beneath, all, and especially the helmet and breastplate, so highly burnished as to glow with white radiance, and scatter an illumination everywhere about on the floor. This bright panoply was not meant for mere idle show, but had been worn by the Governor on many a solemn muster and training field, and had glittered, moreover, at the head of a regiment in the Pequot War. For, though bred a lawyer, and accustomed to speak of Bacon, Coke, Noy, and Finch as his professional associates, the exigencies of this new country had transformed Governor Bellingham into a soldier, as well as a statesman and ruler. Little Pearl, who was as greatly pleased with the gleaming armour as she had been with the glittering frontispiece of the house, spent some time looking into the polished mirror of the breastplate. Mother cried she. I see you here. Look, look!" Hester looked, by way of humouring the child, and she saw that, owing to the peculiar effect of this convex mirror, the scarlet letter was represented in exaggerated and gigantic proportions, so as to be greatly the most prominent feature of her appearance. In truth she seemed absolutely hidden behind it. Pearl pointed upward, also, at a similar picture in the headpiece, smiling at her mother, with the elfish intelligence that was so familiar an expression on her small physiognomy. That look of naughty merriment was likewise reflected in the mirror, with so much breadth and intensity of effect, that it made Hester Prynne feel as if it could not be the image of her own child, but of an imp who was seeking to mould itself into Pearl's shape. Man, Hawthorne is just not subtle at all about his symbols, that's for sure. When Hester looks at the armor and she's like looking into it, she can really only see the A in like this exaggerated form. So it's kind of like a funhouse mirror. 
And her punishment really is symbolic of how it has just taken over her identity and this is who she is now and that's just who people see um instead of seeing the person they just see the sin um and then when she looks over at pearl it's as if an imp which means like a little like sprite or a little devil has taken over her daughter oh gosh that's gonna be worrisome come along pearl said she, drawing her away. Come and look into this fair garden. It may be we shall see flowers there, more beautiful ones than we find in the woods. Pearl accordingly ran to the bow window at the farther end of the hall, and looked along the vista of a garden walk, carpeted with closely shaven grass, and bordered with some rude and immature attempt at shrubbery. But the proprietor appeared already to have relinquished, as hopeless, the effort to perpetuate on this side of the Atlantic, in a hard soil and amid the close struggle for subsistence, the native English taste for ornamental gardening. Cabbages grew in plain sight, and a pumpkin vine, rooted at some distance, had run across the intervening space, and deposited one of its gigantic products directly beneath the hall window, as if to warn the governor that this great lump of vegetable gold was as rich an ornament as New England earth offer him. There were a few rose-bushes, however, and a number of apple-trees, probably the descendants of those planted by the Reverend Mr. Blackstone, the first settler of the peninsula, that half-mythological personage who rides through our early annals seated on the back of a bull. Pearl, seeing the rose-bushes, began to cry for a red rose, and would not be pacified. "'Hush, child, hush!' said her mother earnestly. Do not cry, dear little Pearl. I hear voices in the garden. The governor is coming, and gentlemen along with him." In fact, down the vista of the garden avenue, a number of persons were seen approaching towards the house. Pearl, in utter scorn of her mother's attempt to quiet her, gave an eldritch scream, and then became silent, not from any notion of obedience, but because the quick and mobile curiosity of her disposition was excited by the appearance of these new personages. This kid, I don't know, she seems like kind of a jerk. I mean, I know that she's little, so she's gonna do, like, stupid little kid things, but still, like, whoa. She, she just seems like a jerk. She's not really a child that I'd want to spend a lot of time with at this point. Um, so she sees some roses that her mom was like, oh, hey, Pearl, go go look at the flowers. And so she's like, oh, OK. So she does. And she sees them. And then she just starts screaming for them. And she wouldn't stop screaming until something else interested her. I don't know. Like, little kids are just weird. And Hawthorne did a very good job of ex giving a really good example of this right there. So that ends our chapter. We're going to continue on because who else is with the governor? We shall see. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.